<laughs> Welcome everyone to tonight's um, uh, Climate Emergency Film Club. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Emily Bauer from PSR Pennsylvania to do our introductions. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome for the fifth installment of the Climate Emergency Film Club. This evening, we have uh, Dr. Dan Walk, who is a PSRP advisory board member, as well as Dr. Beverly Law, who is a professor emeritus at Oregon State University. Um, and I'll pass it on over to them. And I just want to thank you all for joining us again to have these discussions and really dig into this film. So thank you all for your time. Beverly, you go first. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm Professor Emeritus of Global Change Biology and Terrestrial System Sciences at Oregon State University. And although I've been retired for years, I'm working harder than ever. So um, I continue to do more communicating a science that I didn't have as much time for when I was a professor. My research is on the current and future vulnerability of forests to drought and fire management activities. I've also worked in many other ecosystems. And then the other things we do is track um, harvest related emissions, fire related emissions, and the use of whole trees for bioenergy production and what that means for emissions. And um, so I, I can give you a brief rundown of some, some of the things that, that we've covered and have learned about. And we worked on many forest fires. Um, one of the things is the wildfires are um, more of an issue in the Western US, uh, as well as the projections of future fires or increases in fires. But nonetheless, um, because about 80% of fires are ignited by humans, it's important, I think, for everybody to know what's going on with that. Another thing is with forestry, they're starting to do more underburning um, to protect fire forests, and, and uh, it could lead to more smoke-related emissions. And uh, likewise, the use of bioenergy would lead to more smoke-related emissions, fine particulate matter. So, so there are issues to worry about. And you think, what a force have to do with human health? But um, and it's, it, they have a strong feedback to climate. And so when you start removing too much forest, then we end up with more problems, um, like the land becoming a, a net source of carbon to the atmosphere. And then we just don't need that kind of runaway thing occurring. Um, for example, the, some forests in British Columbia have already become a net source to the atmosphere. And it's primarily due to harvest and beetles, those two factors. So, um, so those were the couple of things that I thought about in terms of smoke, but the other one is we'll have more extreme events. That's what's projected all over the place. And that includes heat. Um, and like we had an extreme heat event in Oregon and then and just during the daytime, you could see the leaves on the apple trees folding up and drying out crispy. It was like, like a movie. It was unbelievable how quickly that happened. That kind of thing can happen just about anywhere, but it's more in these areas where you have um, very windy conditions. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's the combination of heat and wind that lead to these big problems. When that happens, then you can have fires that are really intense. And then if you have very strong winds, it can carry that, that smoke from a very long distance to other places. An example is what happened with the Oregon fires is, um, or the California fires it was down around mid California. Um, there wasn't much smoke in Oregon, but there was a ton of smoke in Montana when we were at Glacier National Park. And that's because of the, uh, these high level winds that pulled it up into the atmosphere and dropped it down on Montana. So that kind of thing is hard to predict. And what we would hope is we we get um, the groups that are working on short term predictions would get better at identifying where people are going to have problems from smoke and wind and heat uh, to give them time to react. So um, I think those are the couple of the main things. And another thing is insects and pathogens that's expected to increase with climate change. And it, that's in the case of forests too. I mean, we have ticks still in, in Oregon into November and probably into December because it's just not getting cold enough to kill them. Um, that there, uh, of course, ticks, wood ticks and other kinds of ticks are um, pretty bad in uh, bearing diseases. And there's another issue with water quality and quantity. If um, agriculture starts using more water, um, or if forests are logged, it 
it creates uh, um, risks to the, the water supply to people, the quality and quantity. And there, there are maps of water sources, the primary water sources across the country. And those are useful to see, you know, what we've learned is in the Western US, only 20% of our water sources are actually protected. They're, they're being logged or they're being converted. And, um, you know, that's setting us up for real problems when people have shortage of food and water. So um, I think I'll stop there because I'm not sure where you want to go with questions, but um, I'll, I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you, Beth. Um, sure. My name is Dr. Daniel Wallach. I'm a family physician and geriatrician. I teach residents at the Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania Family Practice Residency Program. I've been concerned about climate change actually since the days of Barry Commoner around 1976. And uh, for the past 20 years, I've been giving talks mostly to my colleagues about climate change and health. Um, having this longer perspective, I have had the misfortune of seeing the effects of climate change that were predicted uh, 40 years ago happening now, which is actually sooner than climate scientists predicted that they would happen back then. Yeah. Um, and uh, as the brand new grandparents, it makes me really worry about uh, what kind of challenges my granddaughter will face when she grows up. Uh, that's a whole other realm of uh, climate scientists, the, the psychological impacts. Um, which is probably beyond the scope of this talk, but we'll be happy to discuss that uh, if anyone wants to. The other thing is I live in a suburb, suburb of Philadelphia and we are struggling to keep in check development of every last unprotected green space in our township, um, which is happening at an alarming rate uh, and while that's happening. They're also taking down mature trees, such as our London plane trees that have that lined some of our streets uh, to make way for tear downs and bigger houses. Um, so that's my world right now. Um, I will be happy to answer questions on climate change and health. Our forests are wonderful filters, as Bev mentioned, for uh, water, but also our air. And uh, I should mention that I think it was two years ago when there were fires going on in Oregon and California, I woke up one morning to a very weird orange sunrise because the smoke had blown all the way across the country, uh, affecting our health as well as people on the opposite coast. Mm -hmm. So at this point, I think uh, I'd like to open up the floor to questions from the audience. I assume you all saw this is a very compelling film, uh, which also pointed at solutions, which was excellent. Uh, and also talking about protecting our local forests, uh, wherever they are. So Emily, are you watching the chat uh, to feed us some questions? Yes, sorry about that. My, I was accidentally muted. Um, I just would love to hear from both of you with your expertise, uh, in particular, how, what actions we could do to protect the forest and thus the climate and our future. Um, I, I can think of your grandkids, Dan. I can talk to that. Uh, we've written several papers on the creation of strategic uh, carbon and biodiversity reserves, and we we couldn't decide what to name it: strategic forest reserves. And, and the reason I, I chose strategic reserves is it's a play on the strategic petroleum reserves that we have. If we've got that, why can't we have strategic? natural reserves or strategic climate reserves. 
whatever word you want to have in the middle there, it's really essential. And uh, it's, it's agreed upon, the U.S. is part of this at um, national and international scales that we need to protect mature and old forests. Uh, and 30% by 2030 is the target and 50% by 2050 to avoid the worst of climate change and to avoid uh, more biodiversity losses or extinctions. And so, so when we look at, at, at these things that we need to be doing, um, the strategic reserves, we did this over the Western US. Uh, we just got our uh, Oregon paper accepted in Frontiers and Forest and Global Change, where we've mapped this out at a 30 meter resolution, both the species, you know, what is high priority to protect for species and for forest carbon, the highest carbon density forest, that's mature and old forests, and for the water availability. We're doing the same for Alaska right now, Southern Alaska. Um, those kinds of things need to be done first. And, and what, what uh, just came out on the register is a request for um, input from people on the these natural, I think it's national natural assessments, NNAs. And this is part of the Biden um, executive order that was to protect mature and old forests. It, it included that in the protection. There are two actually executive orders that cover this. So, um, so what they want to be doing is pretty much what we've been working on um, with the data that we have available, but there's a lot of room for improvement in the underlying observations that go into this, as well as the frequency with which uh, data sets are updated. Uh, because things change, land cover changes. We were lucky enough to get the newest land cover maps that are you know, fairly recent. So that kind of, that goes into saying, you, you need to get involved. You need to read the literature and know or find ways. A lot of people translate what we say in our papers and put it on their NGOs, put it on their websites. Um, and then we did a, a paper that describes it in more uh, for a broader or audience on what are the proposed ways to reduce uh, emissions and increase um, forest carbon. So those are the two goals, by the way, is, is reduce and sustainably reduce fossil fuel emissions and to sustainably increase the, the removals by vegetation and the oceans. And so we're focusing on forests because they're the, by far the, the workhorses. And, and likewise, there are high carbon density forests that that um, are in temperate forests, it's not just in the tropical regions. And they're just as high or higher than tropical forests. We just don't have as much land area in these forests. So, so we, we know what to do and we've provided um, the, you know, from a data, I'm a data person and from a data standpoint, I've listed this in several of our papers. Now, these are the things you need to do to improve our ability to map this and our ability to determine where we need to stop the harvesting and allow forests to grow. And, it, and we just call it setting aside lands that are in maternal forests. Um, and then you say, why maternal forests? That's where all the carbon is. It's, it's, most of it's there. Not only that, they're more resilient to fire and to drought because they can get their roots. Their roots are fully developed. Uh, big trees can store a lot of water and, and they use it when it dries out in summer. So their, their stems actually get skinnier in summer. Um, but, you know, I don't know that you have many, many drought um, situations or just you might have some extreme conditions where you have drought like that. But but uh, it's, it's to say that we've identified areas and other people are starting to jump on the bandwagon. Now it's a matter of getting the agencies to follow through on the executive order. And then another question. Thank you very much, Beth. Sorry about that. Uh, if Another question I saw in the chat was, uh, could someone explain in more detail whether prescribed burns at, is a legitimate mitigation for for larger loss of forest, or as this video suggests, does that put okay. the forest floor at more of a risk? Um, the, the main drivers of fires, unfortunately, everybody thinks it's the fuel. The main drivers are, is wind and heat and drought. Those are the main drivers. Um, so 
when you do underburns, though, it, it can reduce the fuels, but it's not going to stop the occurrence of fire. Because what happens with the fires, you know, especially when you have some really windy days, is you get embers coming in from above, and there's no way you're going to stop that. And so what was found in, in a, found in a U.S. study, I think the Forest Service did this analysis, was they looked at all the areas that they thinned and that they reduced fuels on, and the fires encountered those areas only about 1% of the time, or 1% of those areas annually, 1%. So, so you, you know, it, it, we have... It, Forest lands are very vast, and and if the federal lands in particular, but um, it's hard to be able to know exactly where and when it's going to happen. The fire will happen because of the chaos that that we're, that you have ensuing with things like extreme events, extreme wind events, and and um, even though we we have an idea of where the vulnerability is the highest based on the projections of future climate, it can help in elsewhere. So, so under burning, you know, I, I think of as a, a private landowner, some people will just stack or chip their, their um, debris on the ground, but you don't want it to be uniform distribution. And if you did that, you, it's better than burning it because then it's going into the atmosphere immediately rather than taking 10 years. I don't, this, one of these uh, thinning studies I was on, there's still a lot on the ground from doing their chipping. Um, typically, what they'll do is just stack in little areas so you don't have continuous fuels. But um, it, it's valid in some places, but it's extremely risky. You know, I, I know people will say, oh, yeah, but you, know, you have to know what you're doing. And still, there's chaos ensues, ensues when you suddenly get a strong wind and then the fire creates its own weather or it goes in another direction, even though it's meant to be an underburn very specific conditions under which you do underburns. It means wet and um, low to no wind and hope it stays that way. <laughs> Can you comment on, on uh, traditions of indigenous people in managing forest land? I know some, uh, some people had, people, indigenous people had a tradition of actually using prescribed burns yeah. uh, as part of managing their forests or food and fiber as well as maintaining their environment. Yeah, and then they have traditionally used underburning. A lot of the times um, it was meant to keep brush down or even seedlings down to keep it, you know, to have browse for ungulates and, and that kind of thing, or to keep insects down. At least that's in our area. We have a lot of tribes around our, our research areas. Um, yeah, and they've done underburning for various reasons, um, and we're probably better at it than most, but um, it's, uh, I think the, the I think we I've seen enough uncontrolled controlled burns done by the agencies and they often contract out when they contract out you have no idea what the skills are of the people who are actually doing it. So you know it's not to say that, that the controlled burns are a bad thing. Um, that, that's not the case. Uh, you just want it to remain controlled and do it at a small time. Um, but I've seen over on the east side uh, of the Cascades here and smoke was everywhere and everybody was upset about it because it just spread all over the smoke did um another quick question i saw relating back to the earlier question sorry um, was is there a different forest management technique that is more effective than those controlled burns in your opinion um what that can be done and is in lieu, you know, thinning is the worst thing to do. And I'll get to that in a minute if I try to remember that. It's it is to remove the small trees that are in that serve as ladder fuels to the canopies of the big trees. So, and that's you. That's just very selective and small. I mean, they're small trees like this. And some lean because they are just not getting enough sunlight. But when their canopies are high enough, they can, once a fire starts, they can carry it up to the canopy of big trees. So that's one thing um, that can be done. 
Uh, the other thing we keep telling everybody is the focus really should be on protecting communities that are already existing communities. They're embedded in forest areas, which we have to we have to change the way we're doing things now is to not have communities develop next to the wildland urban interface because people go into the woods and they start fires, even when it's not a really high fire conditions, they'll do that. So, so I think that's the best thing. Um, the other thing we've talked about other people wanted to remove these trees that have whorls around us, like a balsam fir that have whorls of branches. And they said, well, those branches are down low and they'll catch flame. All you need to do is limb them up to a certain height. And, and then you don't need to remove the whole tree. You can just limb them. That's what they are doing in our ponderosa pine forest is that they'll just limb to some level. And, so, so these drastic measures are the ones that cause problems because then they turn up the soil and allow invasive plants in and invasive plants just tend to be more flammable. Um, and just sort of working off of that, another question in the chat was talking about, is it true that forests bring in the rain? That. Forests um, cycle. Uh, the best example is the Amazon because it's such a huge intact forest. Oh, it's not so much anymore. The eastern part's not too great. Um, but they, so what happens is the air comes off the ocean and then it's, it's heavily laden with water and then it falls as rain on the forest. The forests take up the water and they transpire to the atmosphere and they have created this kind of cycle. Well, that cycle is breaking now with all the deforestation that's occurred down in the Amazon. Um, and that, that's a huge concern. You could lose those forests. Um, it, it would be a similar situation if there was more heavy thinning and cutting in, say, our coastal forests in the Northwest and up into Alaska. Um, you could start creating, breaking this, this feedback between the forests and the atmosphere. That's a good feedback. <laughs> a good feedback loop rather than the ones we discussed earlier in right. the film series. Yeah. Um, piggybacking off of your commentary on the Amazon, uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Ned, I'm gonna say his last name wrong, I'm so sorry, Keter, Keter, sorry, Den. Uh, what is the prognosis for the Amazon? Uh, saving it is a carbon sink. What can humanity do to nurture the forest back to health? That's a tough one. Uh, the good news is there's a, a new person in charge and they are all about climate change and they're speaking up loudly at the COP that they're going to do their part. So there was a huge amount of deforestation that's occurred over the past four to six years down in the, in, in the Amazon. And what can we do? Well, um, there are organizations that give to trying to help these help indigenous peoples and those who, who rely on living in those forests and, um, and help others try and protect those forests. So there are organizations that are involved in that pretty heavily. One of the issues with, with um, the Amazon forests is their, their nutrients are above ground. They're in the trees and the foliage. And so when you remove them like they have and turn them into say a crop, they only get a few crops before the soil is so bad that they move on to another area. So, so, you, so it creates this problem of, are you going to be able to get force back there? And I've seen planting projects, but I thought there's needs to be a water project too, to get water and nutrients to them. Um, and the other thing is the, the below ground microbes that, that the trees rely on, that needs to be there too. They have to facilitate the trees to be able to get the forest back there. Um, Patricia Libby had her hand up. Do you still have a question? Yes, please. Um, mine, I guess, is simpler. Um, my heart broke when I saw on the news the other night of an 85 foot tree, pine tree being cut down, dragged off to New York to be put up by the Rockefeller Center. And then it, I'm from Philadelphia, they, they were just showing a 55 foot pine. 
that was being cut down and brought down to City Hall. <sighs> Knowing that trees eat carbon dioxide and give us oxygen, is there any kind of effort across the US to stop all of this <sighs> cutting down of trees, the little ones for people's houses, the larger ones for corporations, schools, cities, um, so that <sighs> It can be preserved for us instead of being ruined. I haven't um, heard of anything at all. I know a lot of people love to have a live tree in their home, but do they realize what they're doing when they go out and buy this dead tree and bring it home? Yeah, the, the small Christmas trees are, um, you know, it's the land that they took from forest is what matters is, you know, the, the natural forest that's good habitat for animals and all that sort of thing. But yeah, there's a lot going on. Um, we've written scientists' letters. Um, some of ours have been delivered to the president and to um, you know, some of the higher ups in the different agencies to go to COP with the mature and old forest lands. Those, those, that's our language. Um, it's gotten into the, into the language that's in some of the documents that you're seeing now. It takes a lot of public pressure to keep that going. Um, there was one I came across where we had we had a letter that had gone out and then uh, people from different groups were responding on it and they were holding um, the chief of the forest service feet to the fire, so to speak, because uh, the executive order was out, but they weren't following it and they're still cutting mature and old forests on the national forests. And so the, a lot of groups are on, on it uh, um, and pressuring them to stop this by maybe even another a rule, some kind of rule that says put a moratorium on cutting on national forests until they get this settled. That's what needs to happen. Are there, has anyone done a, uh, a study of how many trees uh, are sacrificed to Christmas every year? particularly the large trees that are going up the, you know, in cities all over the country? Uh, yeah, I, I guess when, when I think about that in particular, it is sad for the individual trees. Like we had a 400 year old tree that, that our Dean allowed to be cut on our school forest. And it shocked everybody. And it brought the whole community down on the college and that Dean left. Um, 400 year old tree. There is no reason to do that. No reason whatsoever. There's no good ecological reason to cut big old trees. Well, I personally love having some type of Christmas ornament in my house, even though I'm not Christian, but whatever. Um, but I could tell you one thing that, that we do. It's just what a lot of us do. And I, I started this in Florida when I lived down there. I took branches on the ground and bundled them and made a fake tree out of them. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple years old Christmas tree sitting in my closet. It does wonders. <laughs> um, just to bring it back to Pennsylvania and sort of centering it back in, uh, sort of, Dan, uh, Dan, if you have any perspective of this, um, can, how can we educate municipalities about the importance of forests slash trees and wildlife for the climate? Well, I am actually in the middle of a very concerted effort to preserve a 13 acre forest that's on the western side of my township. Um, it's on and it's part of an estate that was designed by the famous landscape architect uh, Frederick Law Olmsted and his brothers. Um, and it was uh, a very forward thinking family where they had, they set it up as uh, not only a forest and, and Olmsted actually mapped out every single tree on this 13 acre properties, and including the species and the size. So we can now compare those individual trees and how they have grown. And there was this uh, one white oak, for example, that uh, is now 50 inches in 
diameter, which makes it probably 250 years old. In other words, it's old as the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, Olmsted was very emphatic about preserving the old trees on the property. So the landowners were very good about preserving it. Uh, and uh, this, there's a lot of history in the site. They set up an entire agricultural training center with greenhouses around the time of World War One, because people want, wanted to be sure that our food supply was secure. So they had women learning how to grow food uh, in these greenhouses and the walls of the greenhouses still stand. Uh, the problem is that our school district, thanks to runaway development in our township, the school has been enrollment has been growing and they put uh, took another estate and put a new middle school on it after obliterating everything on the land. But they needed more uh, playing fields for athletics. So this site is only half a mile from the new middle school and they proposed cutting down 500 trees on these 13 acres and putting in half a dozen playing fields that obviously would only be used part of the year uh, and raising these historic buildings. Um, so there's now a real uproar and a growing movement. Uh, and one part of the movement that's growing is the kids in our township who really are very keenly aware of the challenges of climate change and environmental degradation and are incensed at, at how their parents, uh, peers are so being so careless. Uh, but it's a real struggle uh, because the township, the school district has money and power. And there is also a constituency of parents who have influence who, or who uh, think athletics are more important than a few trees. But as I see it, and as was pointed out in the film, the climate uh, emergency film, every bit of temperate forest makes a difference because our uh, tropical rainforests are in a feedback loop that could uh, uh, make them history and the same for the boreal forest due to the threat of fire. Here in Pennsylvania, our fire risk is low, but we have a virtual uh, bank of carbon in these 13 acres that if uh, those trees are cut would be a huge release of carbon and also the little trees that the school district said would take their place will take a century to serve the same purpose. That's right. I'm glad you said that because people ask why not young forests, why mature forests and mature forests are the next old forests. They're, they're pretty much, they've, they've gained a lot of carbon in, in uh, overall many decades. And um, and you've got to have somebody in the wings. The young forests, like you said, though, are they're a net source to the atmosphere the first 10 to 20 years. And that source, they're, they're giving off more than they're taking up because of the soils outweigh the vegetation. Yeah, one thing you, uh, I'd like you to comment on is uh, when I took a tour of this property a couple of weeks ago, it was with a wonderful arborist uh, who talked about the life cycle of a tree, for example, a white oak. And one thing I hear developers talk about in their meetings with township officials is that they're going to cut down the older trees on our property that they're going to redevelop uh, because the trees are over mature, uh, which uh, by their measure is maybe a hundred years old. And this arborist pointed out that trees have basically three stages where they're young growth and then they're mature and that stage may last another hundred years. And then there's uh, a senescent period where the tree 
is not growing as much, but it's providing a ton of habitat for all sorts of creatures and continuing to store carbon. Uh, so this 250 year old white oak uh, by oak standards is still middle aged. It's not over mature and in need of removal. Right. And, and that's true. Um, and we've done a lot of work in old growth around the world and did a synthesis and they're still taking up carbon, but the value is how long they've stored that carbon. Um, and that's what matters is, you know, it's hundreds of years. It's not in the atmosphere. It's hundreds of years. And so that's what we, when you're talking about removals from the atmosphere, it really should be protecting those big stocks because it's like a bank. It's holding them there for us. It's not letting it go to the atmosphere. And when you do have fires, um, it's not very much actually goes up in smoke. The rest takes decades to centuries to decompose, depending on where you are. You are like uh, like Oregon in that it's fairly wet there and, and you don't have fire so much as an issue in your wetter forests. Uh, the, all the coastal, west coast forests are, are um, pretty much that way. And so it, it's a simple, least expensive, easiest thing to do and um, and pretty much, I think we found it in the Western US, about 60% of these high value forests are on public lands. Now, the other thing you mentioned was land trusts. That's something we're pushing too, because they get a lot of help from the trusts that I've been working with, get a lot of help from federal and state organizations that help restore the native vegetation and um, keep those areas protected. Any other questions in the chat? Um, just another one I just saw was, can you address the advantages of a diverse forest as opposed to the no nomenclatures being planted in the Americas? Um, well, the, yeah, the diversity is, is it. I mean, some of the, like the coniferous forests in general are not as diverse, but when you really look into these forests and a diverse old forest, they have multi-species in them. They have multi-storied canopies. That's what the wildlife needs. They need, they need habitat and food, forest-related species. And so, so the more diversity that you have in those systems, the more diverse the, the, bio, the, the animals and plants will be, the animal and plant species will be. So yeah, it's important that way. Um, there, there's some of these forests, uh, like, um, like ours out here, we have oaks and, and maples and oaks, one of the stages, well, the oaks are being overrun by other forest um, types that are faster growing. And that's what we're trying to get restored. Um, but they, they can live 800 years or more here. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's been shown, we've shown it at a state level and people have shown this at an international level. We did it state, region, and others worked on international. The, they're highly correlated. We have two people with their hands up. Uh, Barbara Laxon. Um, yes, I an issue that I'm involved in, um, I, I found that in uh, national forests, the public forest lands, what happens, uh, most people don't aren't aware or don't understand is that they sell the mineral rights uh, underneath the forest lands so that the oil and gas industry comes in, uh, cuts down trees to create roads to get to their wells, leaves uh, all sorts of debris laying around, um, uh, the wells leak uh, oil, they leak methane, all of that uh, affects the, the uh, wildlife in the area, and um, most people have no idea that this is Yeah, same with water rights. <laughs> um, there are problems with that. And people buying up water rights right underneath landowners. Um, so I forgot to mention one of the things when I talked about strategic reserves and protecting forests, we specify there's a level, the USGS has these levels of protection, this little gap data, GAP, gap analysis project. 
And we say one or two. Gap one is the highest level of protection, and that's wilderness areas and, and restricted nature reserves, that kind of thing. Um, and then gap two um, is, is the next step down. There could be a little work done to, say, um, tame some fires or something on those lands. Um, we say forget gap three and four, which is what some industrialists are pushing for, because they allow mineral and wood extraction. So when you say protect, you really need to be specific at the highest levels of gap one and two, USGS gap. Trisha, you have another question? Yes, um, since I have a sister who lives in California and there were so many fires out there this year, why don't we hear that the federal government is sending out all of their forces to protect these, all of their huge planes that can carry tons of water. You, yeah. There's nothing, nothing. Why? So it's, what's interesting is my neighbor is a helicopter pilot <laughs> and he's been working here in Oregon. He's been in, spent most of his time in California fighting those fires and in New Mexico. Um, it was crazy what happened in New Mexico. They said totally inexperienced. He was fighting the fires. And, uh, and then the people on the ground were doing the wrong thing. They were trying to set back burns and they made it worse, made the fire spread much farther. And, and they were people that were working for the Forest Service, so they might not have had that much skill in that area because they didn't expect to have fires very often. But California, um, they have a lot of supplies there, but again, it goes back to why do we have communities you can't chase people out of their homes, but people in paradise only have one road in and out. They're, they were That was a dangerous place to live. And so we need to do things to help protect them. Now, they, people who wanted to move away found out their insurance companies wouldn't let them. They had to rebuild on the foundation of their past house, but they wanted to leave. Well, the insurance company should have let them leave and build somewhere else, take the money and go somewhere else. Um, so, so there's a lot that has to be done with our communities to keep us from making, from us causing these fires, just igniting them. A lot of those Californias were uh, fires were ignitions, human ignitions, idling on the side of the road, running chainsaws during the dry summer, even just idling. That's what we found when we were doing uh, uh, surveys. Most of it was cars idling on the side of the road. Grasses start igniting and they don't know it. They leave and then it just travels. Bev, I wanted to bring up the one thing that was mentioned in the film, which is reforestation. Project Drawdown estimates that reforestation could lock up uh, as much as 85 gigatons of carbon over the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been a lot of projects all over the world. China did uh, what they call the Great Green Wall, which apparently didn't go so well because it was a monoculture. Mm -hmm. um, but we also have some successes, like the Eden Project in Nepal, uh, this project in India. Brazil has been working on restoring its Atlantic forest. Uh, Colombia also. And then there's something called the the tree tsunami in Pakistan, planting a billion trees, mm -hmm. uh, which is really impressive. Um, do you think there's a place for a big reforestation project here in the United States to, say, plant, replant some of the trees that Paul Bunyan cut down in the 19th century? Yeah, so, so you know, in terms of climate mitigation, it's not going to help, but I mean, for a long time. Uh, 20, 30 years when we only have 20 to 30 years left to really make a huge dent in this. And that's just preventing the logging of the maternal forests. Um, but there still is a place. What we've done in our analyses is we, in, within current forest areas, we reforested. And with the climate and soil conditions and soil fertility, this is modeling. We've modeled what what could that contribute to um, to the ability to re, to have more in the forest, less in the atmosphere? And so we did a study on that, and it, it's it's second, well, it's third in line. But the 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 two biggest things we can do by far, uh, like three times that of what reforestation could do, 
over these decades to 2050 and 2100 is to stop harvesting the mature and old forests and double or triple the harvest cycles on the remaining forests. And we, so, so that, that gives you an idea of when you take it down from a global study to what happens in a region where you have a better handle on the data, um, you can see that the relative effect is, well, it's about a third as much as you can get from these other two things, then it, it doesn't mean don't do it, but I've heard about so many failures where they planted and left and, you know, and they just don't make it. I've seen them here too. Um, they've got to be facilitated. If you're going to do it, do it right. Now, it sounds like also a real transgenerational project too. Yeah, yeah. And that's Kids hard are to great. do. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> it's hard for a government to manage that kind of thing. It, it's something yeah. that has to become part of the culture, which yeah. is why I'm happy about indigenous people taking up management of so many lands in the United States. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. question I just saw from the chat as we're sort of summing up or coming to the end of the hour uh, is what hopeful signs do you see that will give humanity a chance to save the world's forest and save humanity? My hopefulness, um, it's, it's doing what we're pushing out there. Um, and what they've already started to do, but they have to be, they have to be, you have, people have to remind them of what they're supposed to be doing. When they have one level of government that says one thing and the, and the other level that's managing it doesn't do it, that's not a good thing. And people have to be aware of it and get onto it. You know, it's real easy to Google search to find this stuff too. Um, if, like the, like I said, if you just did a Google search of, of, um, protecting mature and old forests, you'll find a ton of information. And it's getting involved, everybody getting involved. I was so proud of my nephew's daughter when she got involved, 16-year-old. <laughs> and Greta Thunberg is amazing. So yeah. we mean multi-generational attempts, and, and that's what I'm hoping for. Tell them every generation has a cause. Well, I think this is the big one. I think a lovely underscore of this entire conversation has been the hope of the next generation. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't let us off the hook. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Just a nice little underscore to tie in everyone. Yeah. And I'd like to echo what Dad said. Um, what I, you know, we have a, a large mass of people who are just doing what people do, which includes cutting down trees and building things on the land and continuing that until they can't do it anymore. But there is a growing uh, uh, constituency of young people who are making their way into politics and into, even into our Congress and local legislatures and raising their voices and expressing their values. And one thing they really value is this planet that they have grown up to see is under threat and it's threatening their very lives and the lives of people who don't, aren't so privileged to be able to speak out in defense of it. So this is, uh, I think this is a hopeful sign that we can actually hold the line against uh, obliteration of the life, the uh, tree and other living things that we depend on for our own lives. Um, so that we can continue to have, move towards a more sustainable existence here on Earth. Thank you both so much. Do you guys have any closing thoughts? I, I think this, uh, my closing thought is I really want people to look at a tree and realize it's alive, it's living. When you look at a tree and say, it's precious, it's doing so much work for us. So think twice before you cut <laughs> and, and really understand how important these systems are for supporting life, human life. We co-evolved over millions of years with all of this life we have on this planet and there is no other planet that's going to come close. So we can't destroy this one.
we can't do it. Absolutely. And I'd also like to underscore the idea that a forest is more than the trees. It's a giant living organism that is doing countless services to sustain us. And we need to point that out to, for example, township officials who think that the only stormwater management system they have is what's been built before by people and that the only, uh, the only pollution we have to worry about is the power plants and we put scrubbers on those and, and uh, catalytic converters in our cars and we'll be fine. But we don't count the huge amount of work that our forests are doing to purify our air and water. Um, and for example, Las Vegas found out that the hard way because after the fires in Nevada, suddenly their municipal water was unusable because all the dirt and ash that previously had been contained by the forest was finding its way into the reservoirs. So that's just one example. And again, we can learn from uh, sessions like this and the climate feedback loop films uh, and carry that education to our local officials who have the most influence on our local environments. Mm -hmm. I saw a comment, Dr. Seuss was way ahead of his time. Yes, he was. <laughs> The Laura <laughs> many lessons. <laughs> and so were the people who uh, established the Adirondack Park to protect New York City's water supply and Fairmont Park in Philadelphia to protect that city, our city's water supply. And this is way back when uh, scientists were just getting to study climate science, science and actually making very good predictions about what how, what climate change would happen with all the carbon we were putting into the atmosphere by burning coal and other fuels. Um, but they also were smart in protected forests. So we have a wonderful place to go hiking, but it's also a place that's supplying us with fresh water. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for your incredible insight and great conversation. And thank every thank you to everyone who's participated in not only tonight, but all of our uh, climate emergency film sessions. I really appreciate everyone's participation. And I just want to say thank you so much for all that. Um, and have a great night. I hope to see you all again, virtually or in real life. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, thank you Kevin. And thank, thank you, you to Dan. the Herm Network as well. And of course, Kevin, every time. Thank you very much. Thanks, y'all. Everyone have a great night. It was a pleasure to be part of this.